Hi everyone, my name is Joseph Holman. This is the second episode of Crowdfunding Masterclass. Um, I welcome uh, the large number of attendees we have today. This is really amazing. This is over double than what we had two weeks ago. It's probably due to the high profile, awesome, awesome panelists that I have on today. Um, we have Darren Marble. He is the CEO of CrowdfundX. It's arguably one of the most successful crowdfunding marketing agencies out there. They've raised tens of thousands of millions, uh, tens of millions for their clients. And then we also have Brian Camillo of Artist Share and Fan Funded. Now, Brian has been around for longer than the word crowdfunding has been around. And he has helped many, many artists raise money and uh, realize their dreams through crowdfunding. Um, before we get started with all the questions, um, we do have a chat window in the upper right corner. Click on that little chat icon and please paste all your questions here. We do have a number of questions that were pre-submitted via our website earlier. Thanks for that. We're going to start with those. But post your questions here, and we're going to try and answer as many as possible. This is a very conversational format. Uh, we're not going to talk much about ourselves. This is about you guys and uh, helping you become more successful. Now, let me hand it over to Darren and Brian to introduce themselves briefly. Um, Darren, let's start with you. Thanks, Joseph. It's an honor to be here uh, with you and Brian. So I'm Darren Marble. I'm the CEO of CrowdfundX. I run a financial marketing firm uh, based in Los Angeles, California, and we help our clients raise millions of dollars from the crowd. Uh, we spent about two years managing Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns. We did about 80 of those, cut our teeth, learned the art of storytelling, digital marketing, uh, syndication, and then ultimately we evolved into the equity crowdfunding uh, arena last uh, May 2015, and currently about 90% of our projects are Reg A plus equity crowdfunding campaigns where issuers have the ability to raise up to $50 million. Yeah, that's, that's super, super exciting. The whole, the whole equity crowdfunding space is up and coming, and there's so much going on, so we'll talk about that more. Welcome, Brian. Please introduce yourself briefly. Hi, Joseph. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Camilio. I'm the founder and CEO of Artist Share. Artist Share was the Internet's first crowdfunding website. Uh, I started it in 2003, basically to help my friends who are musicians who were having a hard time with their record labels. And I built a model where we could go direct to fan, the fans could fund the projects, and we could give them rewards in exchange for doing that. Our first project uh, won a Grammy Award. It was the first uh, album in history to win a Grammy. It wasn't available in retail stores. And since then, we've had uh, 10 Grammy Award winning uh, releases and 29 nominations. We've raised a lot of money for... Uh, handful of great musicians and recently we launched our, our sister site called fanfunded.com which is basically opening up uh, our software and our business model uh, to anyone with a great idea. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Thank you guys so much for being on today. And, uh, you know, because the clock is ticking, let's just jump right into the first question. George asks, um, he actually has a bunch of different questions. This is pretty loaded here, but let's just start at the top. He wants to know what are the necessary steps in preparing a rewards-based crowdfunding campaign, and what are the steps necessary to prepare for an equity and debt campaign, and what are the, the costs? I, I guess he wants to know what are the differences, and what are the different kinds of uh, fees and costs that he would have to expect and, and to deal with. Um, do you want to take this one first, Darren? Sure. I think the strategy is roughly equivalent. Um, the bottom line is you have to come to the table with the crowd. Uh, and if you don't, you're probably destined to fail. So in terms of the marketing strategy, you know, I think the number one uh, uh, strategy that we see works time and time again, whether it's rewards-based or equity crowdfunding, is uh, email acquisition. Uh, whether you're acquiring emails by acquiring customers or you're acquiring emails by driving people to a landing page, getting friends and family to sign up, uh, to receive communications from you, your team, and then nurturing uh, and, and kind of uh, building up enthusiasm and excitement with that list and then marketing to that list um, you know, once you're, you're live in a rewards-based or equity crowdfunding scenario. 
Um, roughly, what does it cost? I think the magic number is about 5% of what you want to raise. So if your goal is to do a million dollar Kickstarter campaign for your widget, you should probably have a minimum of $50,000 uh, slotted for marketing that could be spent on video production, paid media, services, a combination thereof. Same for equity crowdfunding. If your goal is to raise $10 million through a Reg A equity crowdfunding campaign, we would recommend on average a $500,000 half million dollar marketing budget. The reality is to win in crowdfunding, uh, you, got, you have to have a crowd and you have to recognize that it takes a tremendous amount of smart multi-channel marketing to succeed. And if you don't have the resources, capabilities in-house, uh, you're generally going to have to find a partner who has the expertise to run that campaign for you. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Alon has just alerted me in the chat that there seems to be a small issue with the stream and that it, it's live on, on YouTube but not necessarily under the link. So for all those who are having issues, if you would like to post your questions, you can post them directly here. I just pasted the webinar link to crowdflow.co slash webinar. Um, I will just go there now and uh, look for your questions there. Sorry about that, little uh, technical hiccup. This is indeed live. <laughs> um, Brian, um, so what is, uh, this is also still from George, but what, what are the, um, the advantages and, and disadvantages of the, the all or nothing and versus the, the keep it all um, funding model in reward space crowdfunding. When do you want to use a platform or, or a model where you only get to keep the money if you reach your goal and when do you want to use a model where you get to keep anything you raise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, obviously the, the all or nothing model is a, is a great model if you absolutely need that amount of money in order to complete what you're out to complete. Uh, probably the worst mistake you can make uh, as a creator of any kind is to have a campaign, raise the money, promise people something and then not deliver it. Uh, if you're not sure that you have the, the funds or the resources to complete the project and all or nothing is absolutely the way to go. Uh, the keep it all uh, type of uh, campaign, that's also something that's it's uh, it's great. I mean, if you have the money to be able to uh, take care of all those rewards, no matter what, and you just want to subsidize the project, that's fantastic. But let's talk very quickly about fan expectation. Uh, it's ex like I said, it's extremely important that you set expectations properly for your fans and for your backers. Otherwise, you'll never hear from them again, uh, or worse, they'll they can talk badly about you and whatnot. So if you're going to do a keep it all campaign, make sure that you can deliver those rewards. Uh, what we do at Fan Funded is slightly different. Uh, we have something called unconditional support. There's a target amount that is to be raised, and the fan themselves decide whether or not they want their money back if the target is not met, or whether that money can go to the artist unconditionally, uh, no matter what. So it tends to set up a better expectation uh, for the fan, because uh, uh, sometimes the artist is, or the, the creator is not the you know, it's not the best judge of uh, of whether you know everybody has has you know, really thinks that they're 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 going to be successful or a, b they're going to be able to deliver these these rewards no matter what. But you know, life happens, and sometimes that can be a problem. So, uh, so both of those are, are great options. Uh, but again, whatever you choose, make sure that your fan expectations are met. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point, and 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 simply you know just. Figuring out how much you need to fulfill all the rewards that you're promising, and how much you, how much ever you raise, that it has to cover those rewards. Because even if you don't meet your goal, all the rewards that you've sold and promised, you still need to still need to fulfill. Uh, the next question uh, is also a very very interesting one. Um, it's about how much can you expect to raise from friends and family, or how much should you raise from friends and family? And how much can you expect to raise from from the crowd? I know there is a rule of thumb out there that we always tell people that you need to get at least 30% funded 
um, from friends and family right out of the gate so that your campaign looks like a success before um, strangers even become interested in. Darren, do you want to talk a little bit about how that all works and maybe also elaborate a little bit about the differences between rewards campaign and equity campaigns in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. So this is critical. Um, the biggest myth in crowdfunding is that if you uh, create or fill out a form or template on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Start Engine, Seed Invest, yeah, and you launch, people are going to throw money at you. Most people know that that is a total, complete myth. Um, and so you have to very aggressively go out to your friends and family. So here's a rule of thumb. Jo Joseph's right. Um, you have to launch with roughly 25 to 30 percent of your target in the first 48 hours. And, and very simply, we think of crowdfunding as two things and two things only. Crowdfunding is about momentum and perception. That's it. So you have to have momentum when you launch, and that creates the perception that your campaign is off to the races, is going to be successful, and potentially complete strangers can uh, you know, back you and help you cross the finish line. So how do you assess the value of your friends and family network? Well, you create a list, you put them in Excel, and you pull every single one. And Joseph, if you told me right now you identified 300 potential friends and family members and you got firm commitments. You were absolutely 100% sure that your network was good for $20,000. Then I would say, great, cut it in half. That's what your network's good for. So <laughs> you say that you're good for 10, maybe. And then you, that's going to be a third of your raise, so you set your target at 30 grand. Um, the other big mistake is in reward-based campaigns, creators set the targets too high, especially in Kickstarter all-or-nothing campaigns. This is just a dumb mistake. You don't have any excuse to set a $300,000 target and fail. There have been too many people that have made that dumb mistake in the past, so you, you better do your research and know that that's a mistake. I saw somebody the other day, literally somebody who's supposedly a, a, a chief marketing officer at a product company, she was at CES, da 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 da, -da hits me up on LinkedIn with a totally generic message. I click through, it takes me to her Kickstarter all or nothing campaign, $300,000 target, uh, and she was $10,000 funded with 40 backers. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's a disaster. So I said, hey, you know, look, the best strategy is to relaunch on Indiegogo and set a realistic target. This campaign is going to fail. And, and sometimes it's really hard for people to hear, but you have to be realistic. You're always, 100% of the time, better off setting a low target, blowing it out of the water, and making it appear that you're 1,000% funded and you have been successful beyond your wildest imagination. So momentum and perception are the two concepts to grasp. You have to launch big or go home 30% on day one, day two to gain that momentum. Assume that your network, whatever you're 100% certain of they're good for, they're good for half. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's so true. And if you want to find out how many friends you really have, <laughs> just send them a link to your crowdfunding campaign, and uh, you'll, you'll find out real quick. Um, Darren, I have another question for you, because this is right up your alley. Uh, so does the, the funding goal, the, the amount of money I want to raise, um, in, in any way, shape, or form dictate what kind of uh, crowdfunding I, I should use? So is, is there a number you know, above which it just absolutely makes sense to do an equity crowdfunding campaign um, and something that you know, just simply outgrows the possibilities of rewards crowdfunding? Um, how do you look at that? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's probably not a black and white answer, but look, if you're looking for $100,000 in that range, plus or minus 50 grand, go for rewards-based crowdfunding. If you're looking for 500,000 uh, to a million, you may want to look at a regulation crowdfunding campaign um, which just became legal in the United States on May 16th. And if you think you're that company that's going to raise five, 10 million or more, uh, then really your only option is a Reg A plus campaign. So you have to realize to do the Reg A plus campaign, it's a highly regulated industry. Your costs to do a Reg A plus campaign, if you add up the expenses for marketing, legal, and accounting, honestly, to do it right, Joseph, it's gonna cost you 300 to $400,000. So that's something most companies, uh, issuers in this space, don't realize. You're not going to launch a regulation or a Reg A plus campaign for 10 grand. So by that definition, 
Uh, only operating companies, most of the time, are, are going to be anywhere near fits for um, Reg A plus equity crowdfunding. You got to have a, a few million in annual revenue. You probably have raised three million dollars or more. You probably have five thousand customers, ten thousand authentic social fans, ten or more employees. If, if you're listening to this and that doesn't sound, you're not a fit for Regulation A plus equity crowdfunding. Even if you had the budget to bring in the attorney, the accounting firm, the marketing firm, you know, that, that's really relegated for operating companies. Um, usually the better approach, if there's any uncertainty, do a regulation crowdfunding campaign first. Try to raise up to a million dollars. The cost to do that campaign is much cheaper. It's, it's faster too. Maybe it costs you $20,000 between marketing, legal, and accounting. Maybe it's $10,000. Um, and if you, you know, blow your expectations out of the water, you quickly raise a million dollars, great, congratulations, go take a quarter million and apply the proceeds from your regulation crowdfunding campaign to your Reg A campaign. But don't be silly and jump into a Reg A plus campaign because you think you're that company that magically is going to raise $50 million pre-product, pre-revenue. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Um, Brian, I have a question for you. Um, this yes. is from our live audience. Okay. Kate Joyce posted, and thank you for the question, Kate. Is it better to use video or can well-done photography work well to tell a campaign story? Oh, the answer to this hands down, video. Uh, we've tried uh, before in the past. We've had some artists who have been camera shy. They just wanted to do photos. Uh, crowdfunding is basically especially rewards-based crowdfunding, if it's an artistic project, is really about the person. It's really about developing an affinity with the person, and video is the best way to do that. And it doesn't have to be a crazy, you know, expensive, professionally shot video. What we're really trying to do here is to create a relationship and create an affinity between the creator and between the fan. That's where you're going to get your most traction. That's where you're going to get your most longevity. And so a video is absolutely the best way to do that. I'm just going to tell a really short story. Um, I, my ex-wife um, did hated jazz. I'm a jazz musician. Yeah, go figure. Uh, but uh, <laughs> she hated jazz, and I introduced her to a friend of mine named Chris Potter. And, I, and we went out, and we had fun. We had a nice time. And she's like, oh, I love Chris. I said, oh, you want to go hear Chris play sometime? She said, sure. And then we went down to the Village Vanguard, and we heard him play, and it was jazz. And she said, oh, I loved it. It was great. You know, and I said, I thought you hated jazz. She said, no, it wasn't jazz. That was Chris. Right? So what had happened there is that she had overcome any sort of preconceptions that she'd already had and very personal. A video can be that powerful. So if you're jockeying up against a bunch of other people who are trying to raise money for their CD, raise money for their, you know, their next tour, raise money for, for whatever it is, the personality is going to win. All right, the, the, the actual uh, int integration of your persona, video versus photography, hands down, video is going to win. All right, thank you so much. I, um, I want to apologize to everyone who's posting here that uh, the audio quality is bad. I'm not sure if this is one of our particular panelists or if it's me or if it's the whole stream. Um, we are on a Google Hangout on uh -huh. air, so send your Google. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we will still continue. I hope it'll get a little bit better. Um, I turned down I turned down uh, the bandwidth requirements a little bit. Um, Darren, back to you. There are um, various stages of an equity crowdfunding campaign, and uh, K. Foy. I hope I'm saying that right. He wants to know. Um, what are the different stages of an equity crowdfunding campaign compared to a rewards campaign where we know you, you know, you're supposed to run a pre-campaign, an audience building campaign, and then you run your real campaign. How, how does all that work in equity crowdfunding? Sure. So step one in equity crowdfunding, you've launched a business and you're selling something. That's your step one. So before you go out and say you're ready to step up to the plate and take a swing, do you have a business that is operating? Do you have a business that is generating revenue? Do you have a business that is acquiring paying customers? If the answer is yes, you've checked the box. If the answer is no, go back to start and maybe look at doing a rewards-based campaign first. So you have to have an operating company. 
Um, really, the first person you need on your team is the securities attorney. This is not your lawyer, your general counsel. This is a specialized crowdfunding attorney who understands the JOBS Act, who has filed Form 1As with the SEC or filed Form Cs uh, as well, because those are the two uh, legal documents you need to complete uh, in order to be able to legally raise money from the crowd. So the first thing you need, once you're operating, you've got customers, you have a real business, you need to identify and retain a qualified crowdfunding attorney. Yes, these people exist. Um, Sarah Hanks at CrowdCheck, Mark Roderick, these are some of the leaders. Doug Elinoff on the East Coast, higher level. Um, you need a real crowdfunding attorney. That's going to be your, your primary point and your coach. If you don't have the SEC attorney attached, you're probably way early. Um, and, and usually the, the best leads that we get as a crowdfunding agency are referrals from the securities attorney because that means the issuer has done their homework, they've engaged a competent person who understands the legal requirements. That means they've probably done their two years of audited financials for a Reg A+. Plus. Um, and you know, look, once you have those in place, you're operating, you've got your team, you know, you have to have a comprehensive marketing plan. Uh, and this is a digital marketing plan. So what is equity crowdfunding? I'll tell you, it's digital marketing and storytelling. It's actually storytelling and digital marketing. Um, you know, to Brian's point, the story is everything. You have to have a story that inspires people to invest and in wire you money. This is harder than a $25 average reward on Kickstarter. The average investment in these campaigns is anywhere from $1,000 to $2,500. To convince people to wire you money, you have to connect with them emotionally at their core. You have to tell a story that transcends your business. This is not a features benefits pitch. This is not look at my traction, my business model, how big the market is pitch. You need that information, but you can tell that story on the page. This is the why pitch. This is the why CrowdfundX, why Crowdster, why Artist Share. What was it that inspired you to start this business? How did you get into it? What is your vision? What is your mission? What are your values? That's the essence of your story. It is commonly overlooked, commonly overlooked. People totally don't get this. They want to tell the story they tell to venture capitalists. They want to tell the story that they're going to pitch to institutional investors. Wrong story. This is an emotional story. That's really what it is. And then you've got to produce that story at a high production value. You need a really solid video. Our average video production budget, just for context, in a Reg A plus campaign is about $20,000. You cannot raise millions of dollars from the crowd guys on a cheap, crappy video. You can try, but you're gonna fail and you're gonna spin your wheels doing it. Put the money in the video, put the money in the marketing. And once you have the story, you produce it, you need to distribute that story. It's almost 100% digital marketing, a combination of paid media, earned media, owned media. What's paid media? You're buying Facebook ads against a lookalike audience. What's earned media? You target a thousand bloggers and journalists to cover your launch, cover your milestones. And what's owned media? You've got a list of emails of your 5,000 customers. Uh, you've got their phone numbers. You've got your website, your mobile app, et cetera. And it's a comprehensive uh, multi-channel digital marketing plan to get that message out. So really, you know, the success or failure of your campaign in general, and this is true for rewards or equity, lives in the planning phase. If you don't go into your launch with the right plan, uh, you're screwed. So planning is everything, so plan well. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really good point, and, and thanks for that. I want to talk about the video a little more with Brian, because mm -hmm. I, I get this question all the time, right? Yes. And when, when Darren talks about video production costs of 25000 I'm like, hang on a second, in the reward space, 95% of people raise between ten and $15,000, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was the, 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 the fundamental reason for me to to build Crowdster in the first place was mm -hmm. because most people simply don't have the budget to go out and, and afford someone like Darren and, 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 and let alone afford a $25,000 a video production. And, you know, my, my thought was always that, you know, you're, you're crowdfunding. I mean, people get it, right? If you're raising $20,000 to start, you know, maybe produce your next album um, on artist share and you spend $25,000 on your video, naturally that's not going to work out. So how, how do you deal with that at artist share and fan fund and, and what do you think is a good approach to that? Right. Well, uh, the key thing 
thing to remember that there is a huge difference between the message you're sending with equity crowdfunding and the message you're sending with rewards crowdfunding. With equity crowdfunding, you're sending a message of, I'm reliable, I'm dependable, I'm professional, you're going to make money from your investment. From rewards, you're, you're sending a message of, I need money, <laughs> you know, because I have this dream and I really want to be able to achieve it. So uh, the, the, uh, the production quality of the video for a rewards-based crowdfunding uh, campaign, the bar is set a lot lower. And with the, with, I mean, just think of, my, my, I've always, you know, the more the more the things change, the more they stay the same. You know, just think about what you would think. Let's say I'm going to invest money in a company through an equity crowdfunding campaign. Well, my, the first thing I want to see is, do I trust these people? Are they going to be successful? Are they strong? Do they really have a great idea? And if you see a crappy video, boom, gone. But on the rewards side of it. I'm not thinking. Oh, you know, are these respectable? I'm thinking. I want to be. I want my my heartstrings to be pulled. You know, I want to go in and say, Oh, this person is really passionate about what they do, and it can be them with a cell phone taking a video of themselves. You know, in, uh, in the Upper Bronx, saying that this is my neighborhood. This is where I grew up, and I want to interview all the people here and and talk to all these people who taught me how to how to play. You know, Latin music. And uh, and we're gonna you know I'm gonna show them you know send back my love to them you know by creating this this song and we're gonna go over and, and play it for them and you know real street stuff that's the kind of thing that will really get people to join in with a rewards based crowdfunding of course they're not so much worried they know that they're not you know they're not you know making an investment you know they're actually purchasing a dream you know we're we're purchasing someone else's dream. And we just want a nice experience, and we want to, everybody wants to feel good. So, the uh, you can you can do quite well on a uh, cell phone video uh, if it's sincere, and the message is as honest, and it's a, and it's intriguing. And I want to make another comment to to Brian's point. I think. You know, George, I'm seeing your, your comments here about, um, you know, what about the $10,000, $25,000 campaign? And I think, you know, what, what, what I mentioned before is true. You have to come to the table um, prepared to go to your friends, family, fans. And so uh, my question to you is, did you do that? What was your, your, your network good for? Did they put in 2,500, 10,000, zero? If they were anywhere less than 1,000, then there was maybe a lack of planning. Um, you know, the other, uh, there's some other common mistakes we see in these smaller campaigns. Look, not every business, guys, is a fit for crowdfunding. That's true for rewards. It's true for equity. We talked to so many companies that want to do crowdfunding campaigns. Oh, sorry, Jeff. My apologies, Jeff. I, Jeff just corrected me. It is Jeff, not George. <laughs> and I hate when people misspell my name, so thanks for calling me out there, Jeff. Um, so, you know, look, it depends on what your campaign is. And I haven't seen it yet, Jeff, but... You know, we talk to companies, they want to do a $100,000 campaign for an app. Guess what, guys? Nobody's going to put a dollar into your app. Nobody cares. If you have a cool product, the coolest cooler, the Pebble Watch, some uh, kid's book, board game you can't get anywhere else, if you have a differentiated product that is available for a limited time at a discount exclusively on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, now you may have, uh, you know, the, the right fit. And this information is publicly available. Go to Kickstarter. Look at the most funded campaigns. What are the most funded categories? Some categories simply don't work. If you have a services company like I do, we're not a good fit for equity crowdfunding. Um, you need a, a business that makes sense for crowdfunding to begin with. You need a strong friends, family, and fan push to get you launched. And then you have to have a strong digital marketing plan. Either you know it, someone on your team knows it, you hire a solo practitioner or a consultant um, who will run your campaign for you that knows it. And by the way, these people are out there. I mean, we operate on the high end of the market, but if you go to LinkedIn and you type in crowdfunding consultant, um, you'll find a lot of people. The key is to reference check these people. So, you know, if... Uh, Joseph is out there saying he's the guy for rewards-based crowdfunding. These are his uh, service offerings, his fee structure. I would ask Joseph for two or three references. If those references check out, I'm in. But you never want to blindly pay a service provider just because they advertise the service. That's another common mistake is there is desperation out there. These campaigns are not easy, but you have to do your research, ask for references, 
and if the checkout, you know, th then you're good to go. Right, right. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I want to talk a little more about Jeff's um, comment here because he says, you know, he wants to raise ten to 25000 and, uh, you know, how, how to market these campaigns. And there are a few um, questions pertaining to marketing these kinds of these kinds of crowdfunding campaigns. And, you know, I mean, in, in the most simple terms, you, you need capital to raise money. You either need capital to, to hire um, someone like Darren to hire an agency, buy traffic, you know, uh, run Facebook ads, or you need the human capital and, and do it yourself. There, there are tools like Crowdster out there um, that, that make it really easy for you to build an audience, uh, do press releases, you know, do a media outreach and all these things. But it's simply not enough to, you know, just launch a campaign on Kickstarter or or Indigo and, and hope for the best because unfortunately there aren't any strangers out there throwing money at campaigns. Otherwise I guess that's what we'd be doing all day long. Um, but um, <laughs> you know, Brian, what what do you think? What are some of the, the best tips and tricks that you can give um, all these people on our in our audience right now who wanna raise between ten and fifteen, maybe twenty five thousand dollars doing a rewards campaign? Right. Well I think that everything that you're talking about definitely speaks true. Um, there definitely is a place for hiring a consultant, and there's a place for using uh, services that are that are more automated. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for about 13 years now, and here's some patterns that we see. Uh, and it's, again, this it may be obvious, you know, uh, to people, but uh, I'll tell you how we get around the, these things because we do a lot of marketing on behalf of our artists as well. One one rule of thumb is you can't make friends for people. I mean, that's just, you know, you can't expect to hire somebody to go out and make fans for you. That's, that's just not going to happen. You need to make your own fans. But you can uh, find somebody who has, or a service that has access to people who historically have been interested in this type of thing. Uh, that is why uh, we actually have been using uh, Crowdster recently, because what we can do is we can automate that process in, uh, to a point where we can get a maximum exposure to people who have actually already have an interest in this area without having to manually pay somebody to sit down and do it. That's an excellent use of time because you're going for big numbers on there. You're just going for numbers. With regards to uh, the other sector, which is friends, family, uh, fans, if you have a, a list or whatever, your best ally is the person who's already pledge something. That, that is the most ignored sector of any campaign. There people are always trying to get, I need to get more people, more people, more people. No. Pay attention to the people who have already uh, uh, donated to your campaign. Talk to them. Send them updates. Give them a great experience. Tell them to, you know, to tell their friends about it. If you give them a great experience, you give them great updates, you let them in on your process, they're going to they're gonna get excited and they're going to tell other people. You've already got people. I don't care if it's two people. You know, pay attention to those people. That's the best way to market in that area. So a combination of those two things is usually a, a good, a good way to, to go about it. Some people try to manually go out and do the, you know, the blanket carpet bomb, you know, fishnet type of thing, and that's a waste of time. Focus on the people who are who are already in, and, and your friends and family, and especially if you get somebody in who you don't know, who is not neither friends or family and who has donated to your campaign, treat them like royalty. You know, just that's that's my best advice, you know, for marketing on these rewards campaigns. And and what do you do if everything goes wrong? Um, um, Darren, back to you. Jeff here says that he spent ten thousand and did not raise one pledge. He just got a few donations from friends who supported the cause. Um, what's your analysis of that? You know, granted, you don't know the campaign and no specifics. Yeah, look, failed campaigns are tough to swallow. Um, Jeff had a failed campaign. Guess what? CrowdfundX has had failed campaigns too. Um, that's the nature of crowdfunding. There are no guarantees. We've made bets on certain deals, both in rewards and equity, and they didn't work. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to figure out, you know, why didn't this deal work? We thought this was marketable. We thought this was going to be a hit with this audience. We had a budget, um, but that is the nature of crowdfunding. And so I think the takeaway is you have to do some type of postmortem, you know, and, and you really need to look at 
what worked and what didn't work? You know, where did the money come from? Um, was there any money? Why wasn't there any money? You know, where should there have been money? You know, my network said they were going to back me. I thought I was going to get these press hits or these influencers. You have to do a real honest assessment of, you know, what you did and didn't do, what worked and didn't work, almost like a SWOT analysis, and then see if there are lessons learned. And this has been... Uh, shown. I mean, I, I think it was the coolest cooler. They did a campaign and it, it failed or it didn't raise a lot of money. And the next one was the big one. So this is like anything else. It's like entrepreneurship. Nobody builds a billion dollar business their first time. You know, the person that does build a billion dollar business has probably spent a life failing, struggling, learning, iterating, pivoting, um, but being persistent. That's no different than, you know, crowdfunding. You have to get up, dust off your shoulders, figure out how you can improve, and guess what? You can relaunch. You can relaunch on Indiegogo. You can relaunch on Kickstarter. You can go direct to your customer. You can build your own website. You can white label. Um, there's all types of ways. You have more than one chance, but you need to get it right the next time. Um, one other you know, thing to Brian's point, one of the easy hacks in, in rewards-based crowdfunding uh, is, is the messaging and communications tools that most platforms have built into them. And statistics have shown that when you send 30 updates to 30, uh, sorry, 30 updates over a 30-day campaign, statistically that campaign on average raises 400%, 400% more money than the campaign that sends one to three updates over the course of a 30-day campaign. So if you know that, which now you know that, you can put those updates in advance. These don't have to be missives or, or you know, essays. You can have short, sweet updates, have a catchy title, you know, uh, one, two paragraphs and a strong call to action, but you should plan for 20 to 30 updates to your backers. Uh, as Brian said, that's your, your customer base. Those are your brand ambassadors. Those people are already fired up. They've been sold, and they can become uh, your best source of new traffic. They can become your best source of referrals. So take advantage of it and plan your rewards-based campaign with 20 to 30 updates. It's an easy, easy thing to do. Most people don't know it. Don't do it. Missed opportunity. Right, right. Thank you so much. I want to switch gears here real quick. Um, Robert wants to know what uh, what's the merit of having a one dollar uh, reward either on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I guess that's uh, something for Brian. But wh what do you think, Brian? Why why does it make sense, and who should do it? Okay. Well, pricing rewards is definitely an art form. Uh, we've uh, been analyzing this for a very long time now. The merit of a $1 reward is not to get people to buy a $1 reward. The merit of a $1 reward is to give a feeling of inclusiveness, to let people know that you're welcome even if you only have a dollar. Okay, if you put a dollar reward up and then you put a, a, a $20 and a $50 and a $100, you'll find, once you do your numbers, you'll average in at about, you know, maybe at the 30% to 40% uh, price range average. So. You know, if you put a one dollar reward up only, then you're on, then you're only going to get one dollar rewards. <laughs> but yeah. if you put the more expensive rewards up, people will always gravitate towards what they feel they want to spend, how much they can afford to spend, and it just it's a it's a show of good faith, I think, to put up a dollar reward. And uh, again, people don't oh people don't want to buy the cheapest thing. They don't want to buy the most expensive thing. So make them feel like they're you know. They're not right. They're not buying a cheap seat. You know? <laughs> right. Put the dollar underneath, and then a, then a higher, then a higher, then a higher. And I think that's the merit of it. What would this is another question from Eric? Thanks, Eric. But Eric wants to know what would be a great campaign pledge model, and and that you know that they can follow as a guideline. I'll, I'll In take terms it. of maybe you want to take this one, Darren? Yeah. You know, look. One thing to add to Brian's comments, the $25 reward in rewards-based crowdfunding is statistically the most popular reward. So you're going to have your $1 or $5, maybe you have your $500 or $1,000, but you better be sure your $25 reward is rock solid. It's got to be hot. It has to sizzle. It has to be a no-brainer for people to say, my God, I would be an idiot 
not to do a $25 <laughs> you know, transaction on my mobile app. I got to get those beef jerkies or spices. And I, I admit, those are the things I buy on Kickstarter. I'm a spice <laughs> I'm always doing the hot sauces, the jerkies, all the food stuff. It's crazy. I'm telling you my deep, dark secrets. <laughs> Strong $25 reward. Um, and also visual rewards are really critical. If you look at the best campaigns, these rewards are laid out from top to bottom. It's a story. You have to be able to have a user hit your page and without reading a single word, know what your campaign is, why it's unique, uh, what the rewards are, how much they cost, and why they should back your campaign now. That's done through visual storytelling. Yes, you need a great video. You need equally great visual story to back it up. Um, so, you know, there, we call this a rewards matrix. Uh, and you can have early bird specials. Look, the first 100 people are going to get this product for $19. The next 500 get it for 25 And then after that, it's open season. And then, you know, it's still a discount off retail, but it's going to be $35. You're trying to incentivize your early backers to just, you know, it has to be a no-brainer to them. People need to perceive that it's such a deal and it's such a cool product. They need to be in that first batch of 100 er, super early birds, the next 500 early birds. And then the people that come after that, if you fill that out, they're going to say, wow, I really screwed up here and didn't get in in time. I still got to get in because this thing has momentum. People must be onto something. I've got to get in on this. So, again, think of it more from a psychology standpoint, momentum and perception. Okay, cool, cool. That's a, that's a really good answer. Thanks, Darren. I want to stay with you for a minute because I know you're – the king of email collection, and uh, Noble Noble wants to know. You know, we mentioned that uh, email acquisition is the number one marketing tool for for campaigns. So, what are the tactics that you can share that work particularly well to collect emails and um, to build an email list? And we just talked about this last week at your office with lead magnets and all that stuff. What what what, what can you recommend? Sure. So let's talk about the free way to do it. So you have a zero dollar budget and you're hacking this from the ground up. You know, how do you build an email list? There are um, mostly free tools out there. We often use something called curated.co. This is a newsletter tool and it gives you the ability to come up with a theme, you get art and copy, and you can send out newsletters um, and basically, you know, you, you're acquiring emails by putting this newsletter out on your social media accounts that you own and operate. The, you, maybe you pay a small fee for this tool, but it's like a hundred bucks. It's less than that. So you can have these curated newsletters where you're informing people, you're providing content that has some value. And granted, it's organic, so it's going to take time, but that's one cheap, easy way to do it. If you want to take a paid media approach, there's several ways. The first is Crowdster. And truth be told, CrowdfundX, in our big campaigns, we use Crowdster in 100% of our campaigns because it's an automated tool. It's an easy, quick, cheap way to build a following without putting a lot of effort into it. It doesn't get any easier. And this is not just a, you know, a, a blatant promotion. This is what we do for our clients. This is a, you guys are, are, are in a good position to have Joseph on this call and know about this tool. We use it in every campaign. Um, another thing we do is we will buy traffic, we'll buy Facebook ads, and we'll drive that traffic to a landing page. And this is funnel marketing. And then we might offer a white paper. Maybe that's the lead magnet. And we're asking people to give us their name, phone number, and email. And they're going to receive the white paper in exchange for providing that information. But they're also agreeing to receive future communications from the company, who is generally our client, the issuer. And then we can nurture that list. Um, we've run these campaigns. But we do it all the time. We'll acquire emails or leads anywhere from $1 an email to $5 an email, and maybe an average of four, three, four bucks. And honestly, the three, four, five dollar emails tend to convert much more than the cheap fifty cent dollar emails. So, um, ClickFunnel, I think, is the site our team uses. Funnel marketing, you're buying traffic, usually from Facebook, is where you're going to be able to target with precision. Take those people to a landing page, give them a reason to give you their email, and then you can build your list over time like that. That's the number one thing we do when we have an issuer that has an amazing product. Quick example, med device company, they've raised $20 million. Um, they're doing $5 million in sales, limited social footprint, basically no email list. And 
we're spending a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars, buying Facebook ads, driving them to a landing page, acquiring emails, and nurturing those people over time, several weeks, maybe even several months, that becomes the primary target audience for the investment campaign once this client is authorized by the SEC to do an equity crowdfunding campaign. So you've got curated.co, cheap free newsletter, you've got Crowdster, the smartest growth hacking tool you could ever apply to your campaign, and then you can do landing pages and buy Facebook ads, drive traffic, collect emails, nurture the list. And uh, um, let, me ask you, let me ask you one more thing, and uh, thanks for the shout out, by the way. Um, when you start collecting emails, and say you have you know, your first 500 emails on your list, do you then also take these lists and use them on Facebook to create targeted audience and lookalike audiences to further improve your paid media campaign and get a higher conversion rate? And how does that work? Great question. So yes, you can do that. The challenge is you may be creating a lookalike audience off a list that you don't know uh, how good it's going to perform. So generally, the best way to create a lookalike audience, and I'll explain what that is, uh, is off of the backers of your rewards-based campaign or off of the investors in your equity crowdfunding campaign. So here's how this works. You've got an equity crowdfunding campaign. Let's say you've launched on Start Engine. You want to raise up to a million dollars, and you get 350 people to invest in the first week because you did a good job planning your campaign. You can then take the emails of those 350 investors, load them into Facebook, Facebook then will match them up against the people who actually own the accounts and then runs an algorithm and Facebook will assess the demographic makeup and taste profile of that audience of 350 investors and doesn't share that information with you because it's proprietary to Facebook, but what they do do is they create what's called a lookalike audience and they'll say, here's another million people, Joseph, that look very similar in terms of the demographic makeup, the taste, as your baseline audience of 350. Then you can apply a marketing budget and execute a targeted Facebook ad campaign against that new lookalike audience. So the answer is yes, you can and should um, apply media budgets to Facebook ads against the lookalike audience. The, the discipline you need is to do that once you've got several hundred people uh, that have invested in your campaign when you're live or maybe a few dozen backers in your rewards-based campaign. Hard to know if it's effective to do that before you've gotten backers or investors. Right. Very, very well. Thank you very much. Um, Brian, do you guys use um, custom audiences and retargeting at all to promote campaigns of yours? Oh, we do. We do. And we... Uh we have a rather large database at this point of uh, for, through artist share of a, of a very uh, you know it's one huge look like audience <laughs> because of most of our managed campaigns are in the music industry uh, for that so we we take that and we 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 do use the Facebook uh, and a look like audience uh, uh, tool to be able to uh, expand that you know uh, it's, there's a there's a differentiation that I'd like to make here which I think is important to some people. Uh, especially if you're doing an arts-based campaign, um, if you're if you're doing a a product campaign, let's say it's rewards-based, it's a new board game, it's a new watch, it's a new something, else, that's a that's a very very good candidate for lookalike audience, people who are interested in tech, people interested in games, whatever it will be. With with music and arts, it's a little bit more diff it's a little bit more difficult uh, because there's not as much cross pollination. Uh, between various artists, uh, unless you really get granular on on the likes and dislikes. For example, I, I, I you know if I, if I, way back when there was record stores. Um, I remember I was at a record store one time and and I was. Uh, what What are you talking about? What the record? <laughs> what? There used to be a place you could actually buy like these things, uh, and I was looking at a Frank Zappa record, and right next to it was a uh, was a Neil Young record, right? Now I'm a I'm a big fan of them both, you know, but I the the Frank Zappa record was and I was I really wanted to get that record because it had some stuff on it that I wanted to hear, and the Neil Young was you know it was on sale it was like six bucks, and I like them both don't get me wrong but the problem here is if I want Frank Zappa, I want Frank Zappa, I don't want Neil Young I don't care if it's ten dollars cheaper, 
You know, it, the art, arts projects, the, the, the price point and the transference of, of backers from one to another, even within genres, is very difficult. It's very difficult. Even if you say, well, I, I like indie rock. Well, there's a gazillion indie rock bands out there. Some of them you might uh, back and some of them you might not. So it, it really, take a good look at your, what you're selling and what you're, what you're trying to back and see, make sure it falls into a category where there is a transference of audience, where there is a, a real lookalike audience, you know, because if I say, oh, uh, let's do Latin jazz, and I, when we put that in, we find those people like Latin jazz, well, they, you know, they might not like the artists that we're, <laughs> that we're promoting, you know, hands down. So there's really, um, uh, you know, just take, keep an eye on what you're doing. You know, I think before you before you delve into these things. But on the other hand, um, it's an excellent excellent way to build audience, build email, to uh, to get things out there. Use all of the algorithms that are out there, all the services that are out there to help you do this. Uh, I'm going to put in another plug for Crowdster, not because Joseph is here. It's just because we're so impressed with the way it is set up and the way that we're able to target particular uh, backers in particular genres from various uh, sites uh, through the automated uh, Twitter account management. It's extremely impressive. It's extremely inval invaluable to us at this point to be able to um, be able to do that in, a, in an automated sort of way. Um, that was not gratuitous. I actually mean it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I just want to talk about, you know, real quick about another way of creating um, targeted audiences or lookalike audiences on another very popular social network, Twitter. Um, if you if you don't have emails to base um, a lookalike audience on Facebook off of, you can use our backer directory. You can go in there, filter it by category, find super backers as we call them, or serial backers download all the Twitter handles from the search results and use those Twitter handles to create a very similar thing. They call it something else on Twitter, but to create your own custom target audience on Twitter and then run target, uh, targeted ads on Twitter um, targeting these Twitter handles. And, and that works very, very well um, as well. As a matter of fact, the click-through rates are higher and the cost per click are, are lower than for most of the things that we tried on Facebook. It's just another angle um, that you could also try if, if, if you want to go down that, that route. Um, you know, as, as Brian and, and Darren said, this is very, very effective. It works really well. And uh, you can tap into those massive databases that Facebook and Twitter have about their audiences and what they like. All right. Um, we still have some time, so I want to move on to the next question because this is about you guys and not us. Um, Mike wants to know, what are recommendations um, for crowdfunding of a fiction novel? Who wants to take that one? Brian? Um, sure, I'll take that. Uh, recommendations for crowdfunding of a, of a fiction novel? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, that's a pretty broad question. <laughs> uh, well, I guess I, I guess the challenge is, you know, because it, it's it's not like you're you're really. I mean, I guess you're pre-selling the novel, but it it is different from the types of crowdfunding campaigns that that Darren runs, for example. So I thought this is more up your alley. No, no, it it is. It it's it's definitely up my alley, but it's a, it's a broad question. I mean, uh, the recommendation that I would have would be the same recommendation I would have to anybody who's creating something artistic, is to really allow the audience to get to know you as a person and what drives you to do this. I know with, uh, with, with music, what we'll do is we'll, we'll document the process of the music being made in snippets so people kind of get an idea of what's happening. They, they're kind of fascinated by the process. As an author, as a musician, as a game developer, there's a creative process here that, that involves a story. With a, when you're writing a story, there's a story within the story, which is the story of you writing the story. Right? That's going to be very attractive to people. So go to a platform that is going to be more conducive. That's going to be more conducive on, uh, on you know, developing a rapport with the, with the audience and getting them engaged in what you're doing. Without, you know, it's tricky with novels because you don't want to necessarily give away the plot of the story or whatnot, but <clears throat> I'm assuming if you're writing a fiction novel that you're a good storyteller. So uh, find a platform that's going to uh, really 
allow you to focus on uh, promoting the creative process uh, rather than I need X amount of you know dollars for this and you're going to get this widget. You know, again, you have you have a, a huge marketing advantage over um, just a straight up manufacturing type of thing because you do have this creative process that's happening. And if, again, if you're writing a fiction novel, I'm assuming that you're you're extremely creative to begin with. Yeah, I'll give a uh, right, you know, right. So quick, quick feedback. First, the sarcastic answer. Mike, run! Don't do it. It's going to be brutal. Um, now, if you decide that you want a brutal campaign and you're 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 at your wit's end, and this seems to be your only hope, um, I would set a low target. I would I would realistically think ten thousand dollars. If this is your first novel, maybe your first crowdfunding campaign, uh, and I would expect realistically that ninety percent, maybe seventy-five percent, comes from your friends and family. Um, and look, it is possible. Um, there are successful publishing campaigns, but I think they're really tough. Uh, truthfully, I would recommend a highly visual campaign. I would recommend partnering with a really talented graphic designer, so that people are just blown away by your visual story and, and they're drawn into the images and that you transport them to somewhere that they, they feel like they're sucked in, they want, to, they want to know more. So I think it's got to be a very visual story. I think you have to be realistic about how much money you can raise. I would say $10,000 first time, first book is probably what you should aim for. And then again, be realistic and, and, and realize that it's probably going to come from your own network and not necessarily from complete strangers. Right, and you, you need to, in this case, probably set a fixed goal, right, so that you, you only get the money if you reach your goal because you will need a minimum amount of money to get the books printed and, and shipped if, if those are rewards, right? So that, that would be something else to take into consideration here. And um, Darren, I want to I wanna stay with you. Um, Sandra just posted a question, and she wants to know, I know we, we touched on this before briefly, but um, there, there are two main types of crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding out there. There's a regulation A plus and a so-called regulation crowdfunding. They are both part of the, the so-called Jobs Act. Um, if, if I want to try to figure out which one is right for me in, in terms of um, cost of getting a, a campaign like that uh, on the way, what are the differences between the two? in terms of legal cost, marketing cost, you know, all the things that, that are required to make it a success. So again, Reg A plus, if you're looking at that, that means from our standpoint that you are an operating business, you do at least two million in revenue or pre-sales, you've raised several million dollars and have several thousand customers. Um, what are the costs to do a Reg A campaign? It's gonna be about a quarter of a million dollars for marketing. It's going to be about a hundred thousand for legal, and maybe fifty thousand uh, dollars for compliance. Could you do it for less? Sure. Would you want to? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but it's a tremendous marketing effort to raise millions of dollars. Those campaigns convert convert at about a quarter to one percent in an absolute best case scenario. Meaning you're going to need 100 to 400 page views to generate one investor who may come in at $1,000. So you can do the math there. You want to raise $2 million, quarter of a percent. You're going to need 400,000 page views to raise $2 million. Um, so they're very expensive, uh, truthfully. To do a regulation crowdfunding campaign, you know, maybe $10,000 for legal and accounting, maybe $10,000, $20,000 for marketing. Um, my general advice, and this is not self-serving, this is what I honestly believe is the reality in this industry, you should spend the majority of your money on marketing. Um, whether you do it on your own, you hire a company like ours, you hire another company, you should not look at equity crowdfunding as a legal exercise, an accounting exercise. It is a marketing exercise. It is a distribution syndication exercise. Therefore, whatever budget you have, the majority of that should be earmarked for marketing because that's what's going to make you raise money. The people doing the legal work, uh, are service providers you absolutely need, but they don't impact your ability to raise capital. So that's kind of a, a quick gut check. What's the average um, cost per click um, for for a regulation crowdfunding campaign, or uh, compared to a regulation A plus? I mean, it seems to me if you need 400,000 page views, um, 
you know, and the click costs you 50 cents, then you're looking at, you know, a lot of money just for those clicks. Is there a difference in, in uh, the types of equity crowdfunding campaigns and how much these clicks cost and how they convert? Yeah, I would look at it in terms of um, the ultimate um, metric, which is what is your cost per acquisition? In this case, it's your investor. So what is your cost per investor? If you have a company that has a built-in audience, you have customers, and you're marketing your offer to your customers, and those customers have a strong affinity to your brand, you might expect a cost per acquisition as low as $75 per investor. If you have no brand equity or limited brand equity, limited email list, limited social media footprint, you're not using Crowdster, you might expect a cost per acquisition, cost per investor, $500, maybe, maybe $750, just depends. So there's a cost involved, and the more audience, the bigger the crowd you come to the table with, the lower your cost per acquisition. The less of a crowd, the riskier your campaign, the more money you're going to spend to see if it works. Wow, I guess the takeaway is that crowdfunding is um, not cheap money, it's not easy money, and regardless whether or not you run a, a rewards campaign or an equity crowdfunding campaign, you do need a budget and you do need a marketing plan, and, and it's all about um, preparation. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in today. This hour is almost, it's already, actually now it's already over again. It's, uh, it's crazy how time flies. Um, I, I want to thank both of you, Brian and Darren. Um, please give people some information where and how they can reach you. Let's start with you, Brian. I, I'm very easy to reach. Uh, just go to either artistshare.com or fanfunded.com and fill out the contact form. It goes uh, right to my office, and and you, that's how you can get in touch with me. Awesome. Darren? Uh, my email is darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, at crowdfundx.io. Our website is crowdfundx.io. Connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Those are my two platforms. And thank you guys for for joining us, and Joseph, it's an honor to be on your webcast. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you again in two weeks. Um, thanks again, Darren and Brian. This was awesome. We'll see you guys again soon, and good luck with your crowdfunding campaigns, everyone. All the best to you. Yep, good luck. <laughs>